Welcome to Indian Diplomacy's second Google Hangout. Today, we have gathered to discuss one of the most important activities, not only of the Ministry of External Affairs, but of the entire government when it comes to our citizens living and working abroad. In the recent past, there have been several occasions when our citizens in foreign lands have faced the threat of violence or large-scale disturbances due to conflict situations. These are the instances where the Ministry of External Affairs has stepped in proactively to evacuate our citizens from conflict zones. Till now, the biggest such evacuation was from Kuwait in 1990 before the first Gulf War. I'm sure many of you would have seen the film Airlift, which is based on this effort. Unfortunately, the film has projected an image of the ministry which is completely at variance with reality. So we thought, therefore, that would, we would speak to some of the actual participants in that mammoth exercise to bring out the true facts. Moreover, EMEA's evacuation efforts did not begin or end with Kuwait. In the recent past, we have had evacuations from a number of situations. From Lebanon in 2006 in Operation Sukhoon, from Libya in 2011 in Operation Safe Homecoming, from Ukraine in 2014, from Libya in Iraq also in 2014, and most recently from Yemen in 2015 in Operation Rahat. Before we go to our panel, let us take a look at some scenes from Operation Rahat. We got formal requests from 33 countries, but we evacuated nationals of 48 countries, including America, England, France, Germany, Australia. In all, we evacuated 4,474 people of India and 1,920 foreign nationals. Operation Rahat was a very challenging operation. The land route was blocked. The airspace of Yemen was declared as no flying zone. And there were pirates in the sea. Minister of State for External Affairs, General V.K. Singh, was given the charge of personally overseeing the rescue and evacuation of a large number of people. Without losing time, General V.K. Singh visited Sana five times. He camped at Djibouti to personally oversee the evacuation work, actively coordinated with the officials, spoke to the rescued people and assured them that the government would ensure that all of them will reach their homes safely. Get your formalities completed, move, vacate the ship, go to the other ship so that you can eat out there and relax out there. Tomorrow. You will be taken by vehicles to the airport and put into the aircraft to go back to India. Just as the government managed to rescue and revive the prematurely born five-day-old child who was brought in an incubator, the Indian effort seemed to provide an incubator-like protection to all those who were rescued and brought back to safety. Indeed, it was Operation Rahat which brought relief not only to the evacuees but also to those who worked round the clock to save precious human lives. We have with us people who have been on the ground coordinating these challenging evacuation efforts. I welcome Ambassador K.P. Fabian who was the Joint Secretary Gulf and oversaw the operation that evacuated 170,000 Indians from Kuwait. To talk about the same evacuation, we have with us Ambassador R.P. Singh, 
who was posted in Kuwait at the time of the Gulf War and in fact who was the last person to leave once the evacuation efforts were complete. I also welcome Ambassador Nain Chalovam, our ambassador in Jakarta, Indonesia, who was coordinating our efforts for the evacuation from Lebanon in 2006 and who was awarded the Prime Minister's Award for Excellence in Public Administration. We also have the present Joint Secretary Gulf, Sri Mridul Kumar, who has played a key role in several evacuations from the Gulf region. We are also joined by Captain D.K. Sharma, the spokesperson and PRO of the Indian Navy, who played a critical role in the recent evacuation of Indians and nationals from 48 countries from Yemen. Lastly, we also have a young IFS officer, John Mai, who was at the forefront during the evacuation from Yemen and who joins us today from Gawahati. Logistically, and also from a man management perspective, an evacuation is a lot of hard work for the officials, both in missions as well as in headquarters. It requires the officials to ensure airspace clearance, liaising with countries at war to have a break in hostilities, getting clearances to move people through multiple locations to ensure their safety. In all of this, factors such as their differing health requirements also have to be borne in mind. It is important that the needs of every individual are fulfilled. The whole government machinery works in synchronization. Ministry of External Affairs, the Defense Forces, Air India, State Bhavans all coordinate to ensure that every individual is cared for. So let us begin with the Kuwait evacuation because that has attracted quite a bit of attention due to the film Airlift. Ambassador R.P. Singh, I don't know whether you have seen the movie or not, but it depicts the embassy clearing out at the first sign of trouble from Kuwait. How different was your actual experience on the ground? Thank you, Vikas. Uh, uh, I have seen this picture. And uh, the real story is that the embassy came to know about uh, the invasion at about uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. It was probably around 6.30 here. And uh, I got a call from Ambassador uh, Arun Buddhi Raja uh, saying that, do you know something has happened? And uh, so, frankly, I, I got up and uh, uh, he said he is going to speak to the Joint Secretary Gulf. And then he spoke to Ambassador uh, K.P. Fabian, who was J.S. Gulf at that time. And uh, all of us then, uh, we went to embassy. And normally it used to take about 10 to 8 minutes from my house. But uh, on that day, it took almost 45 minutes because on the way there were Iraqi soldiers because by that time they had entered and they were roaming uh, in, in, in and around uh, Kuwait. Uh, it, is, it is not true that the embassy people had run away. It is, it is a fact that the embassy, Indian embassy was the only embassy which were working right from 2nd August of the invasion and up to 8th of January in Kuwait. We closed down the embassy only on 8th. Of course, some other practical purposes, the embassy was not allowed to function because the Iraqi government had announced that Iraq is 19th province of Kuwait and therefore there cannot be any diplomats here. There cannot be ambassador here and if they want to move they can they are welcome to go to Baghdad but this was our government uh, decision that uh, we have not recognized the invasion on Kuwait because it's a sovereign country even today and uh, therefore <laughs> after uh, our Minister of External Affairs uh, accompanied by the additional secretary uh, Paul, that is uh, Ambassador I.P. Khosla, uh, Ambassador K.P. Fabian, and Ambassador K.N. Baksi in Baghdad. They met Saddam Hussein and they, they requested him that the Indian embassy should be allowed to function because we have a large Indian community here which has to be repatriated and it is going to take uh, uh, not uh, days, not weeks, but a number of months. 
and which was true. After a lot of discussions with the Saddam Hussein, our delegation decided that as desired by Saddam Hussein, we can move uh, the diplomats, the diplomatic staff to Basra, that is about 180 kilometers from Kuwait, and the non-diplomatic staff can stay back in Kuwait and can function from uh, somewhere else than the embassy. So uh, uh, we requested that, uh, well, that is all right, but uh, we would like to uh, have some uh, uh, something that uh, our at least our diplomatic staff can enter the embassy, and we would like to send our diplomats from Basra to Kuwait from time to time to help our uh, Indian community and also our uh, non-diplomatic staff in preparing the travel documents because uh, the reason was that the Kuwaitis had taken away all the uh, passports from the uh, Indian population who were working in their various uh, places they like maids, drivers and uh, other community and uh, they didn't have uh, travel documents. At that point of time we had about 170,000 people, Indian people from in Kuwait out of which about 20,000 were away on vacation because the schools were closed uh, for summer vacation. So we had in fact in real sense uh, about 150,000 uh, Indians uh, out of which about 120,000 had no travel documents that they can leave Kuwait without any problem. Now, uh, when the, the picture shows that there was nobody in the Indian embassy and he was looking for the ambassador and other diplomatic staff, it was mentioned that, well, they have gone away, which, which is absolutely wrong. It is, uh, it is not true. Because at that point of time, everybody was in Kuwait and we were functioning from the embassy itself. And of course, the Indian population, Indian leaders were also with us in, in, in the embassy and also in an in Indian school and you know, some other places where, from where we were working. Now, after a couple of days, uh, Iraqis, they announced that the, all the embassies, foreign embassies, including their ambassadors, will have to vacate Kuwait by 23rd August 1990. And as decided in Baghdad by our external affairs minister, we also moved to Basra, but not to join our consulate, because we had our consulate also. And Mr. Gurg, one R.S. Gurg was the consul general there, and they probably the idea was that we can go and function from the consulate. But that also we didn't do. The Indian government, our government had decided that we should not to be seen a part of the consulate because then in that case we are working there as a diplomatic staff of India in Baghdad, or sorry, in Basra. And that we didn't want to do. So what we did, we have, we established our office in Sheraton Hotel in, in Basra, uh, which was destroyed, let me tell you, on 16th January itself, and we were staying there right up to 10th of January 1991. Now, we used to send our diplomatic staff from Basra to Kuwait, covering 180, 000, uh, sorry, 180 kilometer from Basra to Kuwait to help our Indian community and also our staff in preparing the travel documents. Now, that used to take, you will be surprised, in normal course, 180 kilometers should, should not have taken more than two hours, but we used to take at least five to six hours because they are on the way, there were mines and they, the, the Iraqi soldiers, they were all around and uh, they, they used to check thoroughly because they said nobody is a diplomat here now and therefore you are like anybody else. But fortunately for, for us, 
for Indians, whether they're, they're normal people or uh, Indian diplomats, they had given uh, that kind of respect to us, and uh, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't touch us so much like any other people, any other Iraq, uh, sorry, the the any other foreigners or Kuwaitis. So uh, they didn't allow us to stay in, uh, in staying in Kuwait for more than a night. So what we did. Two people used to go, they will stay one night there, and that was at the ambassador's residence. So there we had kept everything, whatever baggage or whatever the other assets were there, we had uh, just uh, stored in the ambassador's residence, and we used to go there and function from there at night and also at daytime. We used to go to embassy and uh, uh, used to go there for an hour or so, or sometime even more. Because by that time we had uh, established the ham radio. Because let me tell you, uh, if if in the picture it is shown that's, that the the uh, actor or the producer is, is talking to the ministry on telephone, which is absolutely wrong, because there was no telephone, international telephone collect, connection for months. Well, let's not talk of only on 2nd August. This was this was not there for months. So and also the electricity was cut off, and only the local telephone were operating. We could talk to our our diplomats, our other uh, non-diplomatic staff, or anybody uh, Indian community. International calls were not allowed. Uh, and international telephone calls were not allowed. Okay. Now what we did? Now from 2nd August to 9th August, we had. Unfortunately, no connection with the ministry. Except, of course, it is not true that we were absolutely cut off because we used to send, we were able to send our messages from Baghdad. And we used to send somebody to Baghdad and deliver that message to our ambassador. Then he will see that it is going to ministry. And the response will, will also come to Baghdad, which they will deliver it to us. That continues for about a week, and after that, the ham radio comes. Now, then we used to take or uh, talk almost daily on ham radio with the Joint Secretary Gulf, with the uh, uh, Special Coordination Joint Secretary, Mr. Harish Dogra, and also with Mr. Uh, Mr. Hare, who was Joint Secretary uh, Overseas Indians. And in addition to that, we used to talk to some other people also, giving a clear picture what is happening in Kuwait about the missing people, and so on and so forth. Now, want to talk? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ambassador okay. Singh. I think you have really painted a very uh, comprehensive picture of the challenges that you faced working in that uh, environment uh, mm -hmm. when uh, Iraq had uh, invaded Kuwait and the kinds of uh, difficulties that you had to face even in through for basic communications, let alone you know mobilizing this 170,000 uh, Indians or 150,000. Ambassador Fabian, you were the Joint Secretary Gulf at that time and uh, the bulk of the political coordination that uh, took place which resulted in the evacuation, safe evacuation of our Indians happened at your end. What are your experiences of what actually happened and how you put together this massive coordination effort way back in the 1990s. Thank you. As uh, Ambassador R.P. Singh has pointed out, our embassy in Kuwait was very alert. If they called me at 3.30 Kuwait time in the morning, it shows that they were not sleeping. And uh, we had uh, two concerns when we heard of the invasion. One was, of course, the safety and security of our population, our people there, and connected with that, but also equally important that there should be no military intervention. There should not be a big war, because if there is a big war, it can spread from Kuwait to elsewhere in the region, and you know how many millions of our people were there. And therefore, uh, the first thing, which we did was, uh, we came out with a statement, uh, you know, saying that what uh, Iraq did was wrong and that Iraq should withdraw, Iraq, uh, Kuwait's uh, sovereignty should be re-established. And uh, 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 Foreign Minister Ike Gujarat, he set out uh, on a foreign tour. He went and met uh, Jim Baker, Secretary of State uh, 
United States and uh, others, so also the U uh, UN Secretary General, Perez de Cora. Now, uh, Foreign Minister came to the conclusion very early after the war <coughs> that the United States was determined to have a war. And therefore, it was decided that we had to evacuate our people. And then, as uh, already pointed out by Ambassador Arkisin, we went to uh, Iraq. Now, at this end, what we did was, uh, to simplify matters, we got constituted a subcommittee of the cabinet. And uh, that was chaired by EAM, that is Guzra, Ike Guzral. And uh, we, in the Gulf Division, we acted as the secretariat. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we were fully sort of able to get things done. And such was the smoothness of the arrangement that uh, if I got a call from Air India in uh, Amman saying that, uh, well, 800. Well, those days, you know, we had to speak uh, very briefly. That means there were 800 passengers. I just lift, lift, lifted up the racks and told Secretary Civil Aviation 800. He said, okay. That means he would send the required number of uh, aircraft, I mean, planes immediately. No questions asked. And uh, so that was one part of it. It was very, very smooth. Then we also had to sort of, you know, take care of the you know, our people had lost their jobs. They had lost those who were having shops or other establishments. They had lost uh, uh, their wealth. So we also took up that matter at the United Nations. And uh, over a period of time, it took a little time, but our people were compensated. Now, even after the evacuation had started, we continued with our efforts for uh, peaceful resolution. but. Uh, Unfortunately, we failed. And uh, basically, we also, not only, uh, the, we also sent the food, a uh, ship, uh, a lot of food to uh, Kuwait. And uh, I remember, uh, you know, the Vietnamese were there, and they were also short of food. So we shared that with them. And uh, on that famous flight of uh, I.K. Gujral, well, uh, we had at one point, uh, we had been approached by Pakistani air hostesses. They were held up there, and uh, we had agreed to bring them back to India. Uh, but then somehow, uh, at, before we were about to leave, they called me to say that, no, they cannot come. Probably, you know, somebody from their side, the government or whosoever it is, embassy, must have told them not to come with us. Uh, but uh, we assisted also uh, other uh, nationals. So on the whole, looking back, we can say that uh, the vast mechanism of government of India acted with uh, commendable sort of efficiency. And it is not only the government of India. It was a teamwork between the government and the civil society, especially the community in Kuwait. They did tremendous work in cooperation with the embassy. So on the whole, I think we have done very well. Thank you, Ambassador Fabian. It's really fascinating to hear about such a massive evacuation taking place in 1990 when telecommunications and other infrastructure was not as well developed as it is today. <coughs> but even then, uh, now we have with us Mridul Kumar, who is Joint Secretary, currently the Joint Secretary Gulf, and who has also played a very critical role in the several evacuations from the Gulf region. Mridul, tell us a little bit about Operation Rahat because that is the most recent evacuation that we have conducted in 2015 and we evacuated nearly 5,000 Indian nationals and close to 2,000 foreign nationals. I believe that was also a very, very challenging uh, task because it involved a lot of coordination and a lot of political, uh, you know, back channel communications also. Tell us a little bit about how you managed Operation Rahat. Thank you, Vikas. Thank you for uh, briefing me about uh, the matter on uh, Yemen. Yemen uh, Operation Rahat was an unqualified success, not only for India as a country, but also for Ministry of External Affairs. It proved our immense commitment to the safety and security of our nationals abroad, as also our commitment to the safety and security of other nationals in the larger spirit of Vasudev Kutukutam. But as you rightly pointed out in the beginning, that Yemen, uh, Kuwait was not the only operation. 
there were operations afterwards. In my last four years of working as Joint Secretary in the Gulf Division, we have faced four challenges, major challenges. Two were regarding evacuation, but there were other two in which Indian nationals were assisted in the Gulf countries. 2013, we had about 150,000 Indians who came out of Saudi Arabia through the assistance of our embassy and with the direct coordination with the Gulf Division. This was one of the biggest mm -hmm. operations we did in the last four or five years. Soon afterwards, we had about 6,000 people coming out of Iraq. 7,000, in fact. And that happened when ISIS took over in uh, June 2014, a large stretch of Iraqi territory. We had before that conducted an operation in which 6,000 Indian nationals were brought out from <coughs> because of uh, the implementation of local laws in that country. And then came Yemen. Yemen was uh, definitely an exercise in itself. You would see that uh, we were put to a very difficult test. And you cannot uh, come out of flying colors out of a difficult test if you have not well prepared yourself. I must tell you that uh, we were watching the situation in Yemen in a very uh, close range for the last one year before the actual incident took place. In September 2014, the Houthis took over Sana'a and uh, there were very clear indications that Yemen is going to erupt, uh, there may be a civil war, there may be difficulties for our nationals there. At that point in time, we were in regular contact with our mission in Sana'a and we had started doing our groundwork. The previous operation in Iraq was a good learning example for us and that helped us in preparing well for Yemen. In January, when uh, President Hathi, uh, Hadi's position was weakened by the Houthi people taking over Sana completely, we were the first ones to have realized that. You would be surprised uh, because that on 19th of January, <coughs> anybody, any foreign country, including the Western countries, issued an advisory for their nationals to evacuate Yemen. We had done that. We didn't stop at that. We continued following the situation. And we had sent one team of ME and MHA officials primarily to see three aspects of our uh, situation there. One was how we can secure our people working in the embassy. Secondly, how we can secure Indian nationals living in Yemen. And thirdly, if the situation worsens, what will happen to our strategic interest in that region? So to look after all these three aspects, we sent that team. And that team came out with very clear recommendations. This happened from 6th to 13th of March. You would be surprised again that we were actually forcing what was happening in Yemen. On 25th of March, the, uh, the entire thing erupted. And uh, Yemen came into attack by Saudi forces. By that time, we had mobilized all our sources. We had already created a standing group under the guidance of Honorable Prime Minister and it was done in July 2013. And that group in included all the major stakeholders, all the ministries, important people, key players from the Ministry of External Affairs. So they were all a part of that group. And that group was kicked in much before the actual operation started. So we were very well prepared in terms of operationalizing what we had to do. And you could see that not only this operation involved MEA, but it in, in involved Air India, it involved Ministry of Defense, it involved our Navy, it involved our Ministry of Shipping. On 26th Jan uh, March, when the, the uh, Yemen operation was started by us, at that point in time, ours was the only embassy present in Sana'a. Most of the other embassies had closed down by that. So obviously we remained the only point of contact for not only Indian people, but also for other nationalities. And when you see the amount of uh, num numbers of people we have brought out, it is not only Indians, but a very large number of foreigners were also evacuated. And these foreigners came out not only from countries which are our neighboring, but from P5 countries also. Americans we evacuated, we evacuated UK nationals, we evacuated French, we evacuated Russians. So all those people were brought in, brought out by us. If you look at the, the entire planning, if you look at the entire quantum of exercise and if you look at the way the entire exercise was carried out to complete perfection, you would see that all the stakeholders <coughs> did their job well. The guidance was very clear. We had very clear political leadership. 
which guided us in the entire operation. Our external affairs minister called the Saudi foreign minister on 27th of March. He again called him on 29th of March. On 30th of March, our prime minister spoke to uh, King of Saudi Arabia. These communications were important because you would see that this, we, we were trying to evacuate people in the warlike situation. The, there was naval blockade, there was blockade in the air, nobody could fly either the commercial aircrafts or the uh, military aircrafts and without Saudi permission there was no possibility that we could either bring out our people through the sea route or through the navy, uh, uh, air, route. air route. If you look at the situation on the ground also our people were spread all over the place. We had huge difficulties in terms of bringing people by road from different cities in uh, Yemen to our place in Sana. We, what we did was we, we coordinated our efforts because we realized that to bring out people from Sana directly to India was an impossible task because of the air blockade. So we decided that we should have Djibouti as our hub. And once we have created Djibouti as our hub, we requested the Saudi authorities to give us a air, air time which would allow our aircraft to fly in from Djibouti to Sana, which was about 30 minutes flying time, bring our people in about half an hour, load them up and bring them back in about half an hour. So we were getting on an average two hours, two and a half hours of that particular flying time. You would be surprised that this whole operation was personally supervised in Sana and Djibouti by our Honorable Minister of State for External Affairs, Dr. General B.K. Singh. And under his guidance, this entire operation became a very smooth exercise. I would recall one very uh, interesting incident which, which he recalled to us. He said that in one of the, he actually sat in every flight which moved from Djibouti to Sana and bringing our people back. In one of the flights, because of the air, air time given to us, the time, air window given to us, we, he realized that there were Saudi fighter planes which were almost accompanying our flight. And it gave us a huge, hugely scary moment. So it was not a very easy task for us to do. If you again look at the operations in, in the seaport, the seaports were under heavy shelling, they were never blockaded, and we had to request the Saudi authorities and the other coalition partners to allow us our planes, to allow our ships to move in that uh, from that area. So it is very easy uh, to see that when extraordinary circumstances come about, we have individual acts of heroism. When you, have, when you have extraordinary tasks like operation in Kuwait in 1990, when you have difficulties in Yemen, which is in war zone, when you have difficulties in Iraq, which is almost run over by terrorists and most deadly terrorists, then this cannot be done by individuals. There has to be a huge effort between the states, between the state agencies. There has to be coordination within the state agencies as also between states. And it is the the goodwill of India in the entire region that we can persuade Saudi Arab, we can persuade the warring factions in Yemen to assist us in bringing our people out. And because there was no presence of the foreign uh, embassies also, you can see that we brought in, brought out about 1900, more than 1900 people from 48 nationalities. So that way this operation was a huge success. It got us international recognition in terms of our uh, credentials as a provider of humanitarian assistance in, in, in cases of problems arising any place in the globe. And I think uh, that it very clearly demonstrates, along with our operations in Iraq, our operations in Kuwait earlier, that uh, there has to be an appreciation and understanding of warlike situation and how, how hazardous it is, it is for people to be brought out under those circumstances. Absolutely. No, thank you very much, Mildur. I think you have given a very comprehensive picture of the tremendous coordination, both abroad and in India, that we had to do to ensure the safe return of our Indian nationals as well as foreign nationals uh, from war on uh, uh, Yemen. Uh, but before we return back to Operation Rahat, let us uh, focus on Operation Sukhum, which took place, uh, as you know, in 2006 from Lebanon. And the person on the ground was Ambassador Neng Chalovum, who was then our ambassador to Lebanon. Uh, she is now currently our ambassador to Indonesia and she is joining us from Jakarta. Nemcha, we'd be very happy to uh, listen to your insights on how you managed to coordinate this very significant operation, Operation Sukhun, from Lebanon. Thank you, Vikas. I, I 
should start by saying that every evacuation is different. The nature of the crisis was very different from what it was in Kuwait. In the case of Lebanon, um, it was uh, uh, the bombing of the, uh, the Hezbollah by the Israeli Defense Forces that started the war. Basically, from one day to the next, you found yourself in the middle of war. And uh, so you had to think on your feet, uh, how to reach out to the people who you want to help. They, you know, in the case of Lebanon, these are all uh, literate or semi-literate or illiterate workers were spread out all over the country. Most of them were not registered with, uh, with the embassy because many of them came illegally. And uh, so we had to devise ways to reach out to them in the midst of all the bombing and the shelling by activating all the contacts we had, including the Gurdwara, the temples, the associations representing all the various states, and uh, find out from them in what state they were, would they like to be uh, evacuated. Uh, that's how things started. But we reached out to them. And how did you uh, at the, the embassy task? end. How did you manage the task? The task you know, because many of them did not have passports the task, also. I mean, many of them did not have passports also. I mean. Yes, of course. Uh, we, we were a very small mission. The, apart from me, there were three, uh, well, two other diplomats and uh, eight staff members, including the security guards. And that was all the resources we had. Uh, so we had to put uh, everyone, uh, many of these. Uh, Indian nationals didn't have their uh, papers in order. Some had no passports, some had no uh, work permits. Um, so different kinds of uh, irregularity in their documents. So even before we could think of evacuating them, we had to deal with their paperwork. And for that, we had to work very closely with, this, uh, with the country, with uh, the Lebanese authorities, who in the midst of uh, all that they were going, th going through were very, very helpful. They, uh, they were very understanding. And I think one of the victories we scored was that we managed to uh, regularize uh, the papers without paying a cent because these were poor people who couldn't afford to pay the fines. And uh, um, more so because many of them had their wages locked up with, uh, with their employers. And in fact, because of that, many of them, in spite of the situation, uh, were not clear whether they would evacuate or not because they didn't want to leave their hard-earned money behind. So these were all the various uh, issues we had to deal with. No, really fascinating, uh, you know, uh, how a three-member mission managed to evacuate so many Indians from Lebanon way back in 2006. Uh, really creditable, and perhaps that's the main reason why you were given that award also uh, by the Prime Minister, I think, uh, very well deserved. Let me now return back to Operation Rahat, and we are privileged to have with us uh, Captain D.K. Sharma, who is the spokesperson of the Indian Navy, and the Indian Navy, as we all know, played a very significant part in uh, Operation Rahat. Uh, tell us, uh, what were the logistics involved in creating these uh, air bridges and sea bridges to evacuate these Indians and foreigners from Yemen? Well, thank you, Vikas. I was just waiting for that. Now, since we have spoken about all the diplomacy and all the uh, groundwork which was done, let me tell you, let's come down to a very micro thing now, a ship which has been now ordered. All uh, the, the MEA has done the job, the embassy is on the standby, the people have been mustered. Now you just imagine a ship, for example, in uh, Op Rahat, Aina Sumitra, which was out for the last 30 days, she was doing an anti-piracy patrol in the Gulf of Aden. She is on a different mission. But that is the beauty of a naval ship. Whether it is, you know, we have four roles, the military role, the constabulary, the diplomatic role, and the benign role. So this duty which came or the directive which came from the government of India that you have to go in and now start the evacuation. So the role, the role reversal was there. The ship had to be changed from, uh, it was carrying out uh, anti-piracy role. It had to be changed into now providing relief and succor. It had to go in, in uncharted waters. We were going into a place which has uh, strife tone. Nobody has gone there. The pilotage facilities are not there. The port control is not there. There is no support. Now you are going into a dead zone, a blind zone, in which now you can imagine a 40-year-old commanding officer with his 180 people is now being interested to go and pick up 340 people who are waiting, who are also displaced. They are badly, you know, uh, mentally disturbed that they are leaving their places behind and they are coming out and going where they don't know. This gentleman, Aina Sumitra, when she made her first approach, she was told on the 30th, 
on the 30th night when she entered Aden, believe you me, it was under fire as uh, Mr. Mridul has told, absolutely under fire. The, he had now four duties, if you see. Safety and security of the ship, which is going as an ambassador of the country. Safety and security of the evacuees. Then the medical help to be given. You don't know what kind of state the people are coming in. They were pregnant ladies, the later stages of pregnancy. And see the, the mental state of the patient. The people with high blood pressure. They don't know that uh, while coming up, you know, somebody can develop some kind of... And we have only one medical officer. And then the logistics. How to make them comfortable. We do not, uh, as a warship, the first evacuation was 349 Indian person, which had children, which had women, which had elderly people. So they had to be brought in. They were carrying their luggage. Documents had to be checked in that kind of a scenario where you have, you have no time. So what is the bona fide of that man or the lady or the gentleman, whether he belongs, whatever documents he is producing are correct or not. So the onus is to pick him up by doing some kind of preliminary checks and then going and we move them out overnight sorties and then the MEA role uh, comes in when Djibouti the immigration and all everything was done on that side and during these things you know I must also tell you at this point in time when you are going into a harbor and a situation is like this and uh, the merchant marine has not come in over there for the last two, three, four, five weeks because as he is telling you do not know where a sunken boat is there or what is there and if a ship goes and hits, believe you that is a, a crisis for the ship itself. So this is how the things were done one after the other and then we uh, established the, because the Sanaya field was not available, because Air India could not land over there, Indian Air Force also pulled in their assets, the C-17s were there at Djibouti. So a kind of a sea bridge was established between the three ports. Al Hudaida on one side, Aden in the center, and Al Shahar on the on the on the eastern side. And the ships uh, in between, when Sumitra was doing two major warships, that is INS Mumbai and INS Tarkash, were diverted from Bombay. And again, the planning which was happening, which Mr. Mridul and uh, Vikas uh, told you, that it all started a few weeks back. That we were getting ready for all this. So we had the logistics over there, the medical bricks, the HADR bricks. The communication, everything was being carried on Mumbai and Tarkash. And also, we hired two vessels from the SCI, MB Corals and uh, one Kavrati, more, uh, Kavrati, 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 which were all moved as a convoy. These two ships became a, hosp a hotel ship in Djibouti, so that the people can come and rest over there. And then the next bridge was the C-17 gets, the uh, Air India gets, or the Navy gets people from Yemen to Djibouti. And from Djibouti, Either it was the C-17 which goes to Bombay and then goes to Kochi. So this is how the bridge, the air bridges were established and the sea bridge was continuously uh, established and then uh, we pulled out almost through the, uh, the sea bridge, 3000 plus people were taken out with many nationalities because you know in these kind of situations there is no caste, creed, color, nationality. The order was to just take the people out, bring them safe. And I believe one of the ships was even awarded. Uh, three ships, all the three ships. Uh, the first ship, Sumitra, ha the CEO has been awarded with the Shaurya Chakra and the other two CEOs uh, have been given Nausana Medal Gallantry. Excellent. So it was uh, recognized by the government of India and uh, this is how uh, it was done in unison with all the agencies plugged in at all times. Absolutely. I think that's what Colonel, uh, Captain DK Sharma has brought out, how the entire government machinery worked in perfect uh, synchronization to ensure the safety and security of all our Indian nationals and the foreign guests that we uh, secured out of Yemen. Let me now turn to John Mai, a young IFS diplomat who was on the ground in Yemen, uh, you know, uh, at the time of uh, Operation Rahat. Uh, I think he was based in Djibouti. John, can you hear us? Sir. Tell us, uh, you know, as a young IFS officer, you know, doing your first evacuation, what, what, what were the kind of experiences you had? What were the kind of, uh, you know, people that you met, uh, people who were coming out of distress situations? How did you cater to them? Sir, uh, briefly, uh, uh, the first challenge that we faced when we reached there was to run a 24-7 control room based in Djibouti, which we were able to do uh, from the day first when we reached. Secondly, then we have to do the planning every day. Every day after evacuation, we did a planning which was led by the MOS. 
General VK Singh, every evening, every night we did rather. But the, the most unfortunate part to which we were able to adapt later was that the thing cha changes every day. There's no planning which was executed the next day, the way we plan. It was always a new thing. We have to improvise on the ground. Thirdly, that we faced being in Djibouti was that once people were out of Yemen, when they reached Djibouti, the problem that we faced in Djibouti was the continuation of the paperwork that we faced, the problem of travel documents, mm. sorting it out. And then there was a huge uh, language gap with the people in Djibouti, with the officers, which delayed the procedures, the paperwork, the documents, the formalities there. Then after moving people from the dock, from the port to the air bases, to the Djibouti airport was a huge task. There was a problem with the transportation. Every day there was a new situation. Despite this, I, 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 I believe when I came back after 10 days from Djibouti, I believe I, I came back as a thinking that people ha have gone back safely to their respective homes. Thank food. you, sir. How did you manage the food situation? <laughs> the food, food, I, I, food was a situation that we have, we, we were, the food and the water, the, the, the uh, honorary consulate there, and, uh, and we had a very few Indian origin, Indian citizen based in Djibouti. That was another Excellent. problem. Okay. I think Captain D.K. Sharma also Sir, uh, uh, during this time, when we had uh, two hotel ships over there. Correct. So they were loaded from the, uh, right. Cochin so and also one warship used to be there in Djibouti right. to take care of all this. And uh, you can well imagine that uh, with the civilians, there was no timings. The galleys or the kitchens of all the ships were running 24-7 because we had children, milk required, uh, you know, the elderly people with medicines and all these things. Uh, that is how it was managed. Great. I think now it's time to open up uh, the debate. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of people watching us on the Google Hangout. And if there are questions uh, which uh, we can take from uh, others who are listening to us and are curious about uh, how the MEA coordinates these massive ex evacuation exercises with other government departments, then this is your chance to ask us those questions. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good evening. I'm Shagun and I'm calling from Delhi. Yes, Shagun, what's your question? So my question is here uh, for Mr. Uh, for Ambassador R.P. Singh. Yes. Ambassador. Uh, where it comes in two parts. Uh, so we know that the LF movie, it depicted Akshay Kumar who rescued the entire, in, uh, who rescued all the Indians from Kuwait. So would you say that this is completely untrue? And if yes, what was the role of the Indian community during the evacuation? Good point. <laughs> okay, now uh, let me tell you on 1st August 1990, in the picture it is shown that they are dancing and drinking and the drinking and the cabaret dance etc. they were all prohibited in Kuwait. So I really don't know how they have done this. Number two, on 2nd August, when uh, Akshay Kumar talks to ministry, there was no telephone connection. We don't know how he can talk to the ministry. Number three, when he goes to the Indian embassy, it is shown that the embassy uh, has deserted and the ambassador and other diplomats and staff has gone away, which is absolutely wrong. Let me tell you, let me clarify certain things. The Indian Embassy played a very important, uh, important role in association with the Indian community there. In Indian community, I can name some of them. And one was Mr. Uh, uh, Matthews, Sunny Matthews, who was general manager of uh, Toyota company in Kuwait. And one was S.S. Uh, Vedi, who was very close to his residence was very close to our embassy there and Mr. Abraham and one KTB Menon who had a house in Salmia in Kuwait and but at that point of time he was in London because he had a house in London also. Mr. KTB Menon had said that uh, you know you can evacuate all the Indians and I can pay for them but that his request was not accepted by us 
and what we did that with the help of uh, the uh, indian uh, community leaders we established four uh, uh, committee one was evacuation committee the other one was the transport committee then relief committee and the health committee and with that we were functioning the the, um, the food stuff it came through a ship which was not only uh, distributed to the indians who were in need but also to other countries including bangladesh sri lanka and pakistan and even other foreigners who came we gave them whether it was rice whether it was tea coffee sugar etc etc now what we did we had a committee of uh, transport committee and evacuation committee uh, it started sometime in early september and it took more than 2 months to send those people 120000 people from kuwait to jordan the distance was 1900 km we will send them by buses at one time i have seen myself i in fact i was there we sent 110 buses in one day uh, uh, sending 5000 people and this exercise continued right up to end of october early november when we when when, when we have sent all of the indians except 7 to 8000 people who didn't really want to go in fact we had a meeting with them on 8th of january 1991 asking them that were they uh, telling them war is imminent and if you stay here maybe you will die and their answer was that whether we stay here or, or go to india we in any case we may have to die so better we would like to die here than going to india but so those were the only 7 8000 people who, who remained there but with their own wishes uh, uh, but we still pressured them that we, we were you must leave but they didn't leave and therefore we stopped that operation on 8th of january 1991 now so far as the food is concerned there, there was no dearth of food after getting the ship there and all the uh, the community leaders they worked day and night in sending those people by buses we collected from the indian community in fact with the help of mr sunny matthews and others a lot of contribution by them so that the people who didn't have money they can uh, they can also go and uh, uh, from jordan of course it was by by air so uh, uh, there there was uh, this continued uh, for for uh, for for two months more than two months and let me tell you that after this evacuation was over uh, we had left with the huge money which was contributed by the nris there and we deposited in the bank Ambassador Budi Raza and myself, we deposit in a bank in Basra for the Prime Minister's Relief mm -hmm. Fund. And that was the situation. And in Baghdad, when the community goes, the Indians uh, going by buses, they were all helped by our embassy in Baghdad. It is not true that the ambassador will just ask them, so I can offer you a, a, you know, a glass of water and some uh, biscuits. They were, they were fed with uh, good, good food and and uh, you know they they were sometimes uh, staying for a day in baghdad who couldn't afford now uh, uh, there is a, always a question is asked that the, how did you organize this uh, sending these uh, so huge people and what were the priorities our priority was after discussing with the various and we divided them in four five categories the number one was pregnant ladies then old old uh, men and women who were very sick then we had uh, the the students of 12th and 10th classes we also included them in the priority list and of course various nurses and others so that was our our priority yeah. on the basis of that so good i think ambassador rp singh has clarified mm -hmm. very conclusively that uh, yes the indian community in kuwait did play a very important role in coordinating with the Indian embassy there, but at the same time, it was definitely not a one-man effort as Airlift tries to portray. Okay, can we have one more question? Good evening. Good evening. This is Sumit from Mumbai. Hi, Sumit. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is for Mr. Madhul Kumar and Captain yes, Sharma. Yes. Uh, one of the things that was shown in the movie Airlift uh, was that uh, you, were, you guys were having issues of identifying internationals during, uh, during an evacuation. And could you please tell us more about the process of verification and what are the technologies or database that we use and how were the passport issued when the citizens were uh, had lost their passports and all their passports with their employer? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Allow me to explain that yeah, to verification you, the entire process. process. Yeah. I mentioned in my presentation that we started identifying the problem uh, about six, seven months before it actually happened. And by that time, we had asked our ambassador, Mr. Amrit Lagoon in Sana, that he should activate all the Indian community members through the local leaders so that we, they have a database of how many people are working in different establishments, Indian people. And there should be a ready list in all different cities. So the, the six months from September till January, February, September 2014 till January uh, 15, till January, February 15, we compiled the entire database. We realized that there were over 4,000 people of, uh, of India who were living in different parts of Yemen. Uh, we provided them, in case they didn't have uh, passports, we provided them uh, emergency certificates. It was a massive exercise, but we did that exercise in anticipation that there may be a time when we need to evacuate them at a very short notice. And thankfully, because this entire exercise was done well in time, we didn't have much of a problem. But still, you will find that a lot of people who were not able to come up to us in terms of uh, asking for either passports or emergency certificates, they came up later when the situation became worse. A lot of people landed up in Zibuti with no paperwork. And we had to provide them papers, emergency certificates on the spot in Zibuti. So again, uh, it was a planned effort. But obviously, when you have a warlike situation, even the best of the plans can go haywire. But thankfully, in our case, it was a very small number of people mm. who were given emergency certificates in Zibuti itself. Uh, and to add, uh, to add to Mr. Yeah. What happened to the India and when they yeah. No, no, no. I'll just tell you that uh, what Sir is saying, that whatever was possible or, or could be done in the preparatory stages was done. Now comes the final moment of embarking. And if you don't have the documents, we had very clear instructions. We had our own SOPs. We had made sanitized zones on the ship, which means that only people who have proper papers in place, which was given to us by MEA, that if so and so, so and so things are available, they will go to this place. Ladies and children were only allowed inside the compartments of the ship. Rest everybody, since the sortie was more than, almost less than 24 hours and uh, more than 12 hours. So they were provided all the facilities on the upper deck. And we had our security in place. We were keeping an eye on everybody. We had the CCTVs were on and they were made comfortable. But more or less, the gentlemen, the, the, the able-bodied people were not allowed to go inside. The ship was not thrown open to uh, the gentlemen, only the ladies or the patient. It was the uh, procedures which were given by the MEA were followed. I think uh, it's already, yeah, it's already nearly an hour. I think uh, this was a very productive Google Hangout where we really were able to discuss in depth uh, India's various evacuation efforts, starting, of course, from the massive effort in Kuwait in 1990 and continuing all the way to Operation Rahat in 2015. I hope uh, through this Google Hangout, we have been able to give our viewers an insight into the tremendous coordination that goes into an evacuation effort, how it's never a one-man show. It's always a group effort. It's always a team effort where Team India comes together, all the ministries, whether it is the Ministry of External Affairs, whether it's the Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Defense, our Air Force, our Navy, our Army, they all come together in the national effort, in a national endeavor to ensure the safety and security of our Indian nationals living and working abroad. Uh, it's been a pleasure to interact with all of you. I thank all my panelists for their insightful views on the various evacuation efforts and hopes we do not have to see another evacuation anytime soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.